Well, good morning, church. How's good morning. everybody today? Good morning. Wow, we're amplified. <laughs> Take that down a notch or two. So, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Man, it's uh, a welcome reprieve from yesterday. <laughs> so, it was like yesterday, it was turn the oven on high, walk outside, and then say no thanks, and you know, try and get back inside and have a little bit of a relief. But um, it looks like today's going to be a little bit better. So, I think that storm moving through last night helped out a little bit. We do have some people who aren't here with us today. They're under the weather, and and so we want to pray health back into them today as well. And and so hopefully they'll be able to join us next week. I can't, can't believe how many people are out today. So uh, maybe the weather got to them. Well, we've got some great things going on. It's hard to believe that we are starting with lesson 12 this week, the final lesson in the Truth Project series. And uh, for the final installment of our Worldview Tour that we've been taking, we're gonna head southeast this time and gaze upon the face of God again as it's revealed to us in our last six spheres that we have. And this one is on the sphere of community and involvement. And uh, perhaps this one is going to be um, more of a field of inquiry than what the others have been. We'll have the opportunity to draw near to what God has planned for us in our communities and within our world today. And to be able to uh, kind of put things in perspective and put focus on, you know, what our role is within our community, what God has planned in our lives to be in this community, and what plans that God has for our community as well. So our call is truly to be like Him. And so in discovering what that is, we discover His love that He has for us, His love that He wants us to share with our neighbors. So that's kind of a key, I think, in the society that we live in today, is we've kind of lost that connection, that love with our neighbors. We need to get back into that. We need to have that spirit of Christ flow from us so that they, they can feel that love. They can see the love. They can understand that God is working in us and in them as well. So I think this is a really, truly important uh segment that we go through and as Pastor Terry gives his opening message on that today that we get to do the deeper dive on Wednesday. Coming up August 13th we have Orange Track Racing so we get to convert this whole space into the raceway again and that's always a fun time in here. Um, as always we'll have a fresh batch of biscuits and gravy ready to go so thank you Diane for that one and uh, <laughs> that's kind of our running joke that we had every time. And then coming September 17th, uh, Grace Street Cinema, we're going to have Tulsa. And that is an awesome movie, awesome movie. And so on the shelf back there, we've got plenty of tissues. Um, it's kind of lighthearted, but we also have a very serious moment in there. And there's so, some very, uh, very deep emotions that go into here, but it's an awesome, awesome story. And uh, I think it's one that everyone needs to learn and hear. So uh, we have some great things coming up in here and uh, looking forward to it. So as we kind of look into the future here, we're just kind of uh, blessed by God's grace and his presence that he's working with here. And so I, I want to bring us into our call to worship this morning. And before I do that, I'd like to open us up with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you that uh, your love surrounds us, that your community lives within us. And so that as we go out into the world each and every day, that we can bring you with us into that community so that we can share your love, your grace, your mercy with other people in this world that need to have that grace, that need to have that mercy, following with them each and every day. Lord, we thank you and praise you for Pastor Terry and the message that you've laid upon his heart to share with us today. Lord, we just ask a special blessing on him uh, as he goes through his uh, weekly job as well. So he's got a, a big work opportunity coming through on Monday, and we just want you to just shower him with grace and with praise and with blessings for that as well. And Lord, we thank you for all of those who were gathered here with us today, whether you're here on in person or online, and, 
And for those who were not able to be with us here uh, this week because they're off uh, having ailments of some kind, then we just ask your blessing on them as well. So, Father God, we just open these things uh, today into your presence. We open ourselves into your presence. Lord, we, we just ask that you would open our ears to hear and our eyes to see the wonders of your world. Open our hearts to receive your message into it and then to live that message out day by day. Thank you, Father God, for giving us this opportunity to gather here today, freely and openly, in your presence, to worship you, to feel you. Thank you for being right here with us, as your word tells us. In Jesus' name, amen. So our call to worship today comes from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and, and this comes from the message translation, so it's a little bit different than what we're used to. Attention, Israel! God is our God. God, the one and only. Love God, your God, with your whole heart. Love him with all that's in you. Love him with all that you've got. Write these commandments that I have given you today on your hearts. Get them inside you and get them inside your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning till the time you fall into bed at night. Tie them on your forehands and on your foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your homes and on your city gates. Wow. That's an awesome message from God. It tells us exactly what we should be doing with his word to live it out each and every day. That's what this is all about. See, we have one God. God he is our God. Now, if we take a look back at when this was written for Judaism, it became the confession of faith and it's called the Shema. And the rules and the laws of the day said that that should be recited daily. And Jesus cited his, this in the commandment that is preeminent above all of the law. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 tells us, you must love your Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So as we look into this word in Deuteronomy, we look at Jesus referring back to that and saying, these are the two biggest commandments that we have for you that you must live out day to day. So in Matthew, he reiterates the Deuteronomy, the commandment that was given to the people back then. The people of God need to know from their innermost being that there is only one true God. Faith in God is meant to be a living relationship involving the totality of everything in your life, a totality of faith and a totality of life. Faith isn't an isolated intellectual belief that you just kind of store away in the recess of your mind. Nor is faith in God performing certain rituals or adopting an uncommitted style of life. But see, he wants us to organize our entire lives around his sovereign lordship and love, love God with our total being. That's what these commands are telling us. This is what God wants us to do. This is what Jesus was laying upon our hearts. Above all everything else, this is to be preeminent above all other things. This comes before anything else in life is to love God and know that God is your God. So this passage is one of the part of the Shema, and it's that confession of faith that is read into then the contemporary Jewish synagogues. And they worship in this, and they, they recite this Shema every Friday and Saturday as their services progress, and they open up the Torah. And these writings are taken directly from the Ark. And so they recite these every week to remind themselves that God is God and God is above all things in our lives. Faithful Jews in Israel were required to read it twice daily just to remind themselves of their faith in God and their dependence upon his word. The central theme of God 
having his commandments in the hearts and teaching them in the home to the children, as Jesus said in his passage, and is relevant in modern Christian homes today as it was back then. We need to make sure that we're passing this word on to our children. And so they understand who God is. If you looked at my post that I had the other day, that I posted up on Facebook, and it said, if we don't teach our children who God is, then the world is going to teach him everything that he is not. And see, this is exactly what this is calling us to. The wonderful thing was, is then later that night, uh, probably, what was that, quarter till 10, I get the call to worship from Terry that he picked, and guess what? It fit exactly into what I had posted earlier. But it is absolutely important for us to get that message into our children and pass it on generation to generation. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we come into your presence right now, we call upon the Holy Spirit to join with us. Join in our hearts today. Open our hearts to hear and accept the message that you have for us today. Bless Pastor Terry as he gives us this message today. And Lord, let us understand and let us take on fully this responsibility of bringing your word and bringing your presence into our children's lives as we live it out ourselves. As we live out that example, words are shallow, but your actions speak volumes to your children. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us these opportunities to gather in your name, to gather in your presence, and to love on you, our one God. Y'all, baby came in the house. So. I know. How exciting. Yes. Good morning. You'd be a lot more Hi, Victoria. Hi. And before we get too far, happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's your birthday. I cannot, I cannot guarantee that we won't sing to you. Sing. <laughs> I was trying to <laughs> Okay, I won't sing. I'll let the singers sing. How about that? <laughs> well, as I was reading this passage and as I was studying uh, for this message over the last few weeks, I'm reading about community and involvement and, I, and this, this baking question that is the last part of the Truth Series project is God cares, do I? And as I saw... Victoria and, and her family come in and say, oh yeah, we care. Look how we're fawning over a baby and fawning over the toddler. Yes. But it it really is like the, the title that is on here is God cares to I. But then I have to say, God cares to you. And that's the question only you can answer. So Yes, it's rhetorical. Nobody has to raise their hand. I'm not going to call anybody out. But what are the things that we care about? Now, the rhetorical question. But when I look at this culture and I look at the world, and it's not necessarily just here, but it's everywhere. I think people are so obsessed with possessions. They, they I got to have this. I got to have that. I kid you not, I, I remember test driving that Toyota MR2 when I was like 24 years old and driving it way too fast down the highway. And I really wanted it. And then I remember test driving a Peugeot because I loved the way those handled. And then I saw the sticker and I tried to make it work at the bank. <laughs> Thank goodness I had a hometown banker that knew me and he knew he just said, mm -mm. Mm -mm. that's not going to work for you. And over time, God has really shown me it, about possessions and, and looking at things and what I care about. And I used to work, I'm a workaholic. I'm a I'm co-president of the club. I worked 100 hours a week. I carried three pagers. I was available 24-7. 
I had a very uh, intense, we'll call it, job at that point. But I missed out on my daughters growing up during that period. And now as I'm older, I think back and I remember when my daughters were born. I remember being there in the room with them and the joy and the love and how nothing else in the world mattered until Monday came and I was back to work. Now that we have grandkids, four beautiful grandkids, we've been able, not necessarily in the room with mom because that's that'd be a little creepy for mom and dad, but we were there right after the kids, grandkids were born and the love. It was almost, you relive that intense love that you had for your kids. You watch their every move. You, you listen to every sound they make. And it, it may be just gas, but that little smile on their face. Like, I love that. And there's something about baby smells. Babies have this amazing smell. It's the love that, that fills our hearts that we're experiencing there, but it's nothing, absolutely nothing compared to the love that God has for each one of us. And God, to answer the, the you know, we looked at that first uh, question, God cares, do I? God cares about us. But doesn't it boggle your mind a little bit that the creator of everything, the entire universe, cares about little old who am I in the, in the grand scheme of things out of billions and billions of people? Who am I that God cares for me? Let's read from Psalm 121. This comes from the New Living Translation. It says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord watches, the Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go both now and forever. Now, when I think of keeping track of something, I think of something like this, smartwatch. <laughs> this bad boy tells me after about 10 minutes of walking, it'll say, oh, you're walking. Do you want to track that? And I can see my heart rate. And, oh, wow, 129. Oops, I better calm down a little bit. <laughs> see how many steps. I can see all this stuff that, and I can track it all. But let's look at this song. In verse 3, what does God do? He watches over you. Verse 4, he never slumbers or sleep. Now, this thing, I have to uh, charge every couple of days. God, there's no charging. He's always there, always available. And then in verse 5, he's our protective shade. Now, we'll talk about him just a little bit, uh, a little bit later in the sermon and, and much more when uh, Dr. Tackett talks about it on Wednesday night, but I'm thinking of the leaf that grew up and over Jonah's head to protect him from the sun as he was up sulking about what Nineveh just did mm -hmm. and repenting of their sins. But he provides that to each of us. Now, a newborn has no idea the love and protection that he or she will get from his or her parents. Too many people in this world do not know the love and protection of their Father in Heaven. They're like that infant that doesn't know the protection from their parents. In verse 5 of our call to worship this morning, we heard, Love God, your God, with your whole heart. Love Him with all that's in you. Love Him with all you've got. It's, it's a command. That we need to give everything to God. You know, Mark mentioned that I have an opportunity potentially this week with my work. My goal is not to make some more money. My goal is not to go, look at me. My 
goal is to use that as an opportunity to give glory to God. And that's what this, it's living out, verse 5 here. Now, let's, let's listen as Jesus takes us to the next level. Because he gets confronted, he's going to be confronted by the Pharisees. And we're going to be in Matthew 22. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to that. And at verses 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. You know what? I didn't put this in the sermon, but it, it's stricken me every time I've read it as I've studied this. You'd think they would have been happy that they got that they went up the other side of the religious leaders. You know, it's the Sadducees have been Jesus, he calmed the Sadducees down. He he got them, he just kind of shut them up. We should be, take that as a win. But it wasn't good enough. Let's read on. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment but he didn't stop. He said, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. That gives us the greatest and the second greatest commandment. But I gotta ask, why is it so important for us to rank everything? Think about that. I remember running track. I was in districts. And in my school, I had broken a 25-year-old 400-meter hurdle record. I was, you know, I just like puffing myself up. But here's part of the problem. I went to districts and I got sixth. The color of the ribbon I got was brown. It wasn't a flashy color. It was pretty dull. I wasn't real excited. And my coach came up to me as I was having a little pity party and he said, look, this is, you're sixth in the district out of all these other schools and all these other runners. Why are you upset? So Coach Bennett, Coach Zellberger, thank you for giving me a life lesson that day. But it's that ranking that caused the Pharisees want to come together and try to trap Jesus by asking him this question. You know, after all, they had created like over 600 laws and they had them ranked and everything. And interestingly enough, a lot of the stricter Jews saw the laws as equally binding. There's some religious leaders that would tend to put them, give them that, that order. Now, that response that we read from Jesus could have gone a couple of different ways. If, if he'd have made a careless response, which that's not going to happen with Jesus, but we would have made that response. We would have had emotion and we would have had bias. Think about talking to somebody who has an opposing view to you and how does that, how well does that go? Do you listen to them and did they listen to you? Now, Jesus' answer would come from the Shema, as Mark talked about a little bit ago, which was one of the core statements of God's covenant with Israel. Now, the Hebrew meaning of Shema is simply the word here. Now, I found it very interesting that as I was going through the different translations, because I'd love to pull them up all side by side and look at them, the English Standard Version, the King James Version, the New International Version, and now we're looking at a broad spectrum of word for word and thought for thought. They all say here. The NLT, which is a little bit further over into the thought for thought, uses the word listen. But listen is just a synonym for hear. Now, I chose the message this morning because I loved the word that they use attention. When somebody says, here, 
but a tension that grabs you, doesn't it? And it makes you want to hear. And the meaning of hear is simply to pay attention, especially through the act of hearing. Well, let's look at this passage from Deuteronomy, just the first a couple verses of the, the passage from this morning, verses 4 and 5. The NLT says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. The NIV is fairly similar, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. They all end up with love God, your God, with your whole heart. Love Him with all that's in you. Love Him with all you've got, which is the way it came across in the message. We are called to listen, to hear, to, to give our attention to it. And honestly, we better sit up and pay attention. We have to take notice of what God is telling us here. And this, this is an affirmation of the uniqueness and oneness of God. So let's look at that heart. Oftentimes we think of the little thing beating in our chest, right? But think of our whole heart. Heart being more of a, an all-enveloping part of you. And soul, all that is in you. And strength, all that strength that you have. And when I think about those, I think of, when I think of heart, I think of intellect. And when I think of, of soul, I'm thinking of our will, our emotions, and our spirituality. And strength, of course, our physical being. Listen to how Mark reaffirms this when he, uh, is, he's basically giving his point of view in this same instance. Mark 12, 29 says, Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. Now Jesus takes that first part from Deuteronomy 6, but the second part comes from Leviticus 19, verse 18, last part of verse 18 there. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it says it that way, and I put up their NLT, but the New Living Translation, the Message, the NIV, the ESV, they all say the same five words. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now this was meant for anyone that you came into contact. It wasn't just Israel. Your neighbor wasn't just another Israelite or, or, or a foreigner. It was everybody. So let's, let's look at this in a little more context by looking at Leviticus 19, 17, and 18, where he says, Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. You see that all too often. Families fighting with family. But it also says, Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. And it ends with saying, I am the Lord. Then a little bit further along in verses 33 and 34, it says, Do not take advantage of foreigners who live among you in your land. Treat them like native-born Israelites and love them as you love yourself. Remember that you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt. I am and the Lord your God. This whole chapter of Leviticus is God instructing the Israelites, but you and I as well, on the principles of good neighborliness and what holiness meant in daily life. And if you all are like me, you went straight to thinking about Mr. Rogers. Because he was all about this is a wonderful example of what the Old Testament implies and what the New Testament explicitly teaches us. In one sentence, verse 40, Jesus refers to all of the Old Testament. These are the greatest and second greatest commandments. 
Yet in Leviticus 19, we are told what a neighbor is, but who is my neighbor? Luke, like Matthew and Mark, records the interaction with the religious leader who asked what the most important commandment was. Luke takes it a little bit further, and at the end of this section, he says the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The New Century Version translated it this way, the man wanting to show the importance of the question. Do you all remember how Jesus answers? He doesn't. He tells a story, the story of a good neighbor. In this story, Jesus tells us what a good neighbor is. It's a Jew, it talks about a Jewish man who's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And if you've been with us long enough, you can go way back and remember the, the graphic that was up there that showed the, what the road between Jerusalem and Jericho looked like. It was dangerous. It was rocky. It was up and down, in and around, and there were plenty of places for robbers to hide. And that's exactly what happened to this Jewish man. He was attacked. He was stripped of his clothes. He was beaten and ultimately left for dead on the side of the road. And then what happens? A priest and a temple assistant walk by. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing them walk by and I'm thinking, he's probably like right there. And they're, and they're like, mm -mm. walk to the other side of the road and keep on going. They barely acknowledge that he's even laying there. That's, that's, in my mind, that's a audacity to walk the other side of the road and keep on going. But then a Samaritan, someone that the Jews, it might sound like an oxymoron, but they love to hate the Samaritans. He walked by. What did he do? He went and he knelt down beside him and he took pity on him and he had compassion for him. He took care of him. He took him to an inn and he dropped he gave his own money. He said, here's two silver coins. Take care of him until I return. And if there's any additional cost, I got. The man, when asked who the neighbor was, responded after Jesus asked him who the neighbor was, was the one that showed him mercy. He couldn't even say the Samaritan. Couldn't let those words come out of his mouth the one who showed him mercy. Now, this popped up. God, this is a God thing. I like the way God works. I'm going to have uh, let's throw the next slide up. This is a picture from a long time ago. I was a uh, junior, just going to be a junior in high school back here. This is on August 8th of 1982. The man you see standing there is Jim Rice. I'm going to tell you a story about the little boy that he's carrying. A line drive foul ball hit that four-year-old boy in the head at Fenway Park. Jim realized in a flash that it would take EMTs too long to arrive and cut through the crowd. So what did he do? He sprang from the dugout and scooped that little boy up. And he laid the boy gently down on the dugout floor where the Red Sox medical team began to treat him. So he had compassion on the little boy as the Samaritan had on the Jewish man. He, took, he made sure he got the care that he needed. Here's this. When the boy arrived at the hospital 30 minutes later, doctors said without a doubt that Jim's prompt actions saved the boy's life. Jim would return to the game in a blood-stained blood uniform, one that he wore as a badge of courage. Then after visiting the boy in the hospital and realizing the family was modest of means, he stopped by the business office and instructed that the bill be sent to him. He took care of them beyond taking care of their son. So our question begs, who are my neighbors? Who are your neighbors? Who are our neighbors? Our neighbors cover a wide range of people. 
We have neighbors around us that are doing very well. We have neighbors who are in need. We talk about this a lot and how we can help our neighbors. But does it really matter who they are? I think what matters more is whether or not you and I are good neighbors to them regardless. Scripture tells us that we always will always have the poor and will always have the orphans and the widows and the sick and the prisoners, the outcasts, those who are unpopular, those who are neglected and left out. The question is, as a good neighbor, what are we going to do about it? The question I have for myself is, what am I going to do about it? And even though speaking truth can sometimes come off as being a little harsh, what are you going to do about it? God has a heart for those people in need. We need to have a heart like God, so we need to be seeking the heart of God. Psalm 113, verses 5 and 9, or 5 through 9 from the English Standard Version says this: Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with the princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. This is where God's heart is. He raises the poor from dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Psalm 113 praises God for being so great and for being so concerned with all of us. From the greatest of us to the least of us. Or at least how we rank us. God doesn't care. He loves us all the same. God is above creation, but he is also present for each of us. To seek the heart of God, we need to stop giving our attention to other things and learn to give him our full attention. This happens for me every morning after the alarm goes off. I go out and I throw one of the pods in the Keurig and I brew my coffee and I go sit on the couch and I get my reading and my Bible open. I spend time with God. We've got a sign in our kitchen that says, just need a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. That's how I start my day. A little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. We need to seek his guidance and rest in his presence. My mind, and I've told you guys this before, my mind races sometimes when I'm sitting there reading. And so what do I do? I pray, Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. But there's a problem. People are not seeking God. And yet, what? He never stops seeking us. Let's look at Isaiah 65, 1 and 3. It says, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, Here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks. Does it not sound like the people that he is talking about are the, the priest and the temple assistant who went to the other side of the road and walked right by the Jewish man? The fact that this world does this this is the stuff that breaks our heart. Especially as we watch it play out day after day. I can't even begin to imagine what Jesus felt as he grieved over Jerusalem. Because when we read in the next chapter of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 7, 37, Jesus tells us that he wanted to gather Jerusalem's children together. And he's not talking about just the little kids. He's talking about his everybody. But they would not let him. How can we seek after the one who has always been seeking us? We must come before God in awe, in reverence, and in worship. 
We must accept God's grace in all things. I was reading a story of a, of a young man. This is a, like a late teen, early 20-something young man who has had miraculous healing in his life. He was on his way to a church, and outside he met an older woman, and she was having a hard time walking, and, and he asked if he could pray for her. And she said, yeah, I'm having knee surgery. And he was prompted by the Holy Spirit to pray right then and there for her. But she said, no, pray on Tuesday when I have the surgery. And he was perplexed and confused. He didn't understand why she wouldn't allow him to pray for her right then and there. And then he asked more questions and found out that part of what the, the, they were doing in the surgery was to replace something that was no longer there. He asked her, don't you believe God can heal you? And she said, not with something already missing. She was missing the point. He said, God created all of this. He can replace what's missing. We must accept God's grace in all things, and we must have a repentant and humble heart. And when we do that, then we are seeking the humble heart of God. In Matthew 11, Jesus offers to take our burdens, to lighten them, and to give us rest. And then he tells us why. Let's look at 28 and 30 in Matthew 11. He says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weak, or who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Throughout the New Testament, we see that gentle and humble heart. John 13, Jesus literally, this is a night he is going to be betrayed. He takes off his robe. He puts a towel around his waist. He fills a basin with water. And what does he do? He goes from one disciple to the next, and he washes their feet. God is washing their feet. Jesus, the Son of God, the Lord of Lords, our Savior, served the disciples. Now we most generally think of Peter telling him, no, you can't wash my feet. If you're going to do that, wash you on my head and everything. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Here's the part that we missed. Jesus washed Judas' feet. He already knew Judas was going to betray him. Yet he washed Judas' feet. Mm -hmm. This is our example. If we are seeking the humble heart of God, then we must serve and we must not only serve those who we know and who we love, we must serve everyone. If we are seeking the humble heart of God, we are going out and we are serving those that most people would just act like the priest in the temple system, right around. That takes me right back to the title of this morning's sermon, God Cares Do I, or Do You. In the very next chapter of John, we learn the way to the Father. John 14, 1 and 11 says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. Here's our hope. And then, of course, we've got Doubting Thomas who pipes up. No, we don't. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And this is where I want to focus this next piece. It says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip says, show us. And Jesus is like, Philip, I've been with you all this time. All this time I've been with you. And you don't know who I am? And then he says this in verse 9. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. It is my prayer 
that as Christians, we would be able to say, if anyone has seen me, they have seen Jesus, and therefore they have seen the Father. It should just be a straight line. How do we get to that point? We do that through involvement, God's involvement and ours. Seeing others as God sees them and recognizing that they have eternal significance. Now, we all have eternal significance. There's that destination thing again. We are all uniquely created by God. We are all created in God's image. We were each created with unique gifts and talents. This is where this involvement piece comes in, and it's through those unique gifts and talents that we're called to do different things. <clears throat> now, remember these two chapters, it's real easy. One's from Romans, one's from Ruth Corinthians. They're both chapter 12. They both talk a little bit about the same thing, and it's in these that Paul tells us about the parts of the church. I'm going to read from 12, uh, Romans 12, 4 and 8. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given each of us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, be encouraging. Serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. I know we got a teacher in the room, so I point that at her. <laughs> teach well. I know she does. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift of for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Paul goes on to tell the Romans and ultimately us that we should not pretend to love one another, but to really love with genuine affection. And we are also reminded to be ready to help God's people when they are in need. We cannot run from God's calling on our lives. God called me to ministry at 14. By the time I was 18, I had my own set, uh, set of goals and, and things that I wanted to do. I went this way when God wanted me to go a different way. Well, that reminds me of Jonah. He tried running, and look where he ended up. <laughs> Belly of a big old fish. And then after he finally relents and he does what God asked him to do, he goes to Nineveh, he preaches the word, and Nineveh turns from their wicked ways. What's Jonah do? Copped an attitude. Went and sat and pouted on a hill looking down at the city. Kind of hoping that God would just kind of smite the city like he did Sodom and Gomorrah, but God had other plans. He questioned God's love and compassion for the people in Nineveh. How does God answer Jonah? He says this, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Here's a city that wants nothing to do with God, yet God is seeking them anyway. Through Jonah, God transformed a city. Through others, he has transformed cultures and nations. On Wednesday night, we'll learn more about how God transforms and how he has used Christianity to change the world. The Bible is absolutely full of people that God has used to bring transformation. Open up your Bibles to Hebrews 11. Read it. It's, it's the, this chapter of all these people who have great faith. And it's just a small portion of the people that God used. On Wednesday night, Dr. Tackett's going to tell us about the life of William Wilberforce, who was an English parliamentarian, a politician. And, but yet it's through a deep sense of God's calling on his life that Mr. Wilberforce would spearhead the abolition of slavery in the early 1800s in England. 
It was a movement that would spread far and beyond anything that he imagined, but not what God, beyond what God did. Now, there's many ways that in which Christianity has changed the world, and people got and continue to get involved. This is how Christianity changed the world, and there's a, a slide here with just a bunch of stuff on it. You know, people have been transformed by Christ, and we come over and we look at hospitals and healthcare, education, labor, science. Doesn't that second column look a lot like the last 11 weeks? Education, labor, science, one that's not up there is law. <coughs> Liberty, justice, like, these are all so many ways that Christians have come in and changed the world. So what do I do? Well, we get our calling from the one who made us, the one who gifted us. We continue to gaze upon the face of God. We continue to pursue God and continually be transformed into the very image of Christ. Pray that God's truth would be a fire in your bones. And then that is when you can say yes to the question, God cares, do I? Heavenly Father, thank you for this series that you have given us, Father, that we have been able to be blessed by your word, through your teachings. Father, that we were able to take this Bible study and do a sermon series right alongside it just because the truths in this series are so important. Father, let us take these lessons that we have learned over these last 12 weeks and let them just become part of who we are. Dr. Tackett speaks of the spheres and the different parts of the foundation. Father, you are our foundation and we need to be in the same sphere with you, going out and doing things as you have asked us and called us to do. Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us, because this truly is the day that you have made. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we come into our time of communion this morning, I want you to think about the life of Christ and the examples that he laid uh, throughout his life and through his ministry here. And when we think about Christ, we think about his love. We think about his compassion, his love for community, whether it's Jew or Gentile. He brought them all together. And see, when we have communion together, it was a bringing together of the disciples. They fought amongst themselves. They wanted to know who was the greater one of them. They weren't joined together. And so in this last and final act, they had communion together at the Last Supper. And he was bringing those disciples together, bringing them into a community with one another. That's what communion is all about, as we join together for communion. We are joining together as disciples of Christ to join in with Christ and to share in his compassion, in his love. See, when he suffered on the cross, he didn't do it just for one person or one group of people. He did it out of love and compassion for all people. And so as we gather together each time for communion, we are gathered together to remember his sacrifice, his compassion, his love for us on the cross had no ending. And it was universal for all the communities of the world, Jew and Gentile alike, you and I today. So as we remember that meal that they had the Last Supper, during the supper, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. And likewise, later on in the meal, he took a cup. And after he had filled it, he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And 
later on in the scriptures it tells us that each time that we gather together we are to do so in the name of Christ to remember him to share in this communion together until he returns so today I call upon you to remember his compassion his love that he has for all the body of Christ broken yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. And happy birthday, Sarah. I'm sorry I missed it. I didn't know. But God bless. And um, so today we just want to, I just want to thank God for safe travels for my daughter, Carrie, and her son, Jace, who flew to Texas Friday. And it's supposed to be Friday night, ended up being Friday and Saturday because they canceled flights and, and caused her all kinds of anxiety and they had to stay overnight in a hotel. And, so it was pretty pretty trauma this weekend, but they made it and they're safe and they got to, she's got to reunite with her other two sons. So very grateful. God is so good. And we thank God for safe travels for you, Mark, that he brings you back every single week to preach for us. We're very grateful and we're grateful for Terry that he's always here as well. And um, so other people I have on my list today include Karen and Marty Morrell, Healing for Marty. Uh, Carla's aunt Mary for possible cancer, Becky's sister and daughter, sister's daughter who went to Thailand to see her dad's side of the family and decided to stay. And that's a very tough decision for everybody and very hard to live through. Is there anyone else who would like to ask for prayer this morning? I'd like to uh, have prayers go out for the family that was murdered in stepsister of my assistant that I had early on and that's uh, her sister and family and uh, oh, that God. was murdered and a little nine year old boy survived and so oh. he's got to oh. grow up without a family and he's going to be traumatized for years to come oh my gosh she uh, survived uh, so I, I posted up her her post yesterday so you guys can all find out more They really need a lot of support, and oh, yeah. he will need a lot of love and support because that hurts him as well. Oh my gosh, do you know his name by any chance? Or no? uh, well, God, I, I don't know off the top of my head. God knows his name. Oh. God knows. Okay. Well, well, we'll start by that with that. So, Father God, oh my. Oh, you know this family that was murdered. And you saved their nine-year-old son, Lord Jesus. I thank you for him. I think that you have great things for him in store. I pray that you will touch his mind and his heart. And comfort him, Lord Jesus, like nobody can. I pray you will place Christian people around him to help him through his life. For such trauma no one should have to go through and I just pray peace with him at all times comfort him in every trial that he is going to encounter throughout his life Lord God that you will walk with him each and every day and Father God we just thank you and praise you for who you are and for your faithfulness to all of us throughout our lives. You have given us prayer to intercede for others. 
You have given us hope in reading and trusting your word. I lift up peril to you, Father God. I pray comfort and healing over him today. He has been your servant, Lord Jesus, for many years. Please bless him and comfort him each and every day and give him peace and joy each morning. We lift up Marty Morrell to you, Father. We ask you to intercede in his life and restore him back to health. Comfort Karen as she helps Marty through this trial. Keep them strong and help them to read your word so they will have faith for the days ahead. We lift up Carla's Aunt Mary, Father God. You know Mary's needs. You know her heart, or you know her innermost being. Please carry her through this trial in her life that she is facing. Help her fear, help her not to fear and to let the healing begin. Be with her family and let them be. Give them the support she needs. Comfort her, Lord Jesus. And be with Carla and Bill as they go throughout their vacation and give them safe travels everywhere they go. And Father God, we pray for Becky's sister and her daughter. One of the hardest things in this life is raising a child and then having to let go of them as they grow up. This part of life is such a challenge, Father God. You give us our children and our grandchildren as a gift to guide them through this life as they grow. They have minds of their own and want to take new adventures in their lives to help them become the person God intended for them to be. I ask for acceptance of her decision, her mom and family. Please comfort their hearts like only you can. I pray this verse over everyone. Romans 8 25 we do not know what we ought to pray for but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express we thank you Jesus that you are our intercessor praise be to God the great I am thank you Jesus Amen. thank you for your help Victoria <laughs> Done it without her. You know, I, I think if, if that young lady in a few years she's got to work for the Lord, she's going to be bringing it. <laughs> <laughs> Come here, see you. Oh, I missed you. <laughs> I, I love how God does this and how He does things. Um, this is from my, my study this morning um, when I first got up, and this is from Romans 12 1. So here's what I want you to do. God's helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. God, I surrender my life to you now. You have given it all, every thought, action, behavior, and desire. I want you to be glorified through me. So here I am, Lord. Take me. Use me. Send me. Change me. Clean me. Transform me. Love me. And love others through me. Take all that I am and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name. And I send you out with this final greeting from Paul from 1 Thessalonians, where he says, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. Go in peace.